Good evening and welcome. Welcome especially to those who are watching from around the country. We will start tonight with Margaret's life story as read by Eleanor Craig. This remembrance draws heavily from the three autobiographies which Sister Margaret Fitzgerald contributed to her personnel file in the archives. Margaret was born in Sterling, Illinois, the fourth of 15 children of Earl Fitzgerald and Virginia Shields. Of her family, Margaret wrote, my father, who was born in Iowa and moved to South Dakota as a lad, went to school part-time with my mother near Mitchell, South Dakota. My maternal grandparents were from Luxembourg. They had 12 children. My mother was the third youngest and the same age as my father, who himself was eldest of eight. My great-grandfather Jackson was in the Civil War. My grandmother was born while he was on leave. When he was ready to return to the battlefield, he said to his wife, she will be your little comfort. So my grandmother Fitzgerald's name was Comfort Elizabeth Jackson Fitzgerald. My father moved to Sterling, where he and my uncle had a confectionery store. He returned to South Dakota long enough to marry my mother and take her back to Sterling. The first six of us were born in Sterling. Then we moved back to South Dakota, where the family farmed. We children were day students at a boarding school and had the German Franciscan sisters from Milwaukee as our teachers. 
As long as I can remember, I wanted to be a sister. I feel I would have joined the Franciscans in South Dakota had we not moved again back to Illinois when I was ready to enter the seventh grade. This gave me my first contact with the Sisters of Loretto. Sister Frances Eileen was my first teacher. Even as a child, I felt that in Sterling, our nuns were the cream of the crop as far as their being good religious and good teachers. It was the depression when I went to Loretto. In looking back, I have sometimes had guilty feelings when I realize how my parents must have looked forward to my graduating from high school and getting a job to help out. However, they never even brought up that question. My sister, Agatha, also went with me to the novitiate. She was received as Sister Agatha Marie, but she had to leave the year we made final vows because of poor health. She never really left Loretto. She was a holy soul and very conscientious. Margaret herself took the name Sister Gerald Ann at reception in memory of a beloved brother about whom she wrote, my brother Gerald and I were in the same class in school, and we were very close in age, as well as in ideals. We walked to school together. We graduated together from St. Mary's grade school. It was mid-June, and on that June the 29th, Gerald drowned in the Rock River near our family home. The large funeral was on Monday, July the 4th. Monsignor Burns had the funeral. He mentioned that Gerald had served the Mass the day he drowned, and that after Mass, Gerald had told Monsignor he wanted to be a priest. God blessed me with a natural talent for playing the piano. My mother told me that from about three years of age, I was always pretending to play. She played, but didn't have time to teach us. I used to spend a great deal of time playing the piano by ear, but somehow I managed the left hand too, and the music always sounded all right. When I was about seven, my sister started lessons for a year or two from the sisters. I sometimes put my sister's music up before me while I was playing by ear. One day I discovered that I actually played what was on the paper. From then on, I was able to play all kinds of music regardless of the number of sharps and flats, and I knew I was playing it correctly. I played with perfect abandon not knowing the names of the lines, the spaces, and the notes. I haunted the public library when I discovered the Etude music magazine. And one Christmas, I found a subscription in my stocking. I was in the convent many years before I had a piano lesson. When I got my BA degree from Webster in 1947, I got a bull telling me to go to the Heights to study music. I was elated. However, during the retreat after summer school, I had a letter from Reverend Mother asking me to go to Elizabethtown, Kentucky for one year instead. In the very next mail, I had a letter from Mother Agnes Marie asking me to stay at Webster for one more week to get help on the pipe organ which I had never touched, since I would need to play it. When I arrived in E-Town, I found that I had to play two masses each Sunday, break William masses three or four times a week, weddings, funerals, missions, and so on. I still don't know how I did it. I was in E-Town six years. 
I did finally get a degree in music from the Heights in 1963. After teaching regular classes for many years in various schools in Illinois, St. Louis, Denver, and Los Angeles, I was put to teaching music itself. I had moderate success, I believe. Although I could not perform, I felt that I gave the pupils a good foundation. As for me, I lost something in my formal training. Never again could I play with the same assurance and confidence, for I was always conscious of whether I was fingering correctly. However, I have always enjoyed playing just to be playing. I have loved every bit of my religious life. I have lived with countless wonderful religious women who have been an inspiration to me. When I entered, I didn't even think about teaching. I just wanted to be a sister. Community has always meant much to me. I love praying together and working together. Many times, I have felt a strong desire to take time out to be more contemplative, but I hesitated to make that desire known out of feelings of guilt that I had to produce for the congregation that had done so much for me. Sister Margaret Fitzgerald did much for the congregation through 50 years of classroom teaching, followed by more than 10 years at the Loretto Center in St. Louis, working on the, at the staff office, managing the circulating tape library, and being in charge of finances. Margaret retired in 1994 and moved to Loretto Mother House Infirmary in 2002. She died peacefully June the 29th on the same date that her beloved brother Gerald died. 100 years old plus, Margaret lived 82 years giving and receiving as a sister of Loretto. Just before she died, Anthony, Mary, and Margaret read Giant in the Wilderness together. Margaret was very impressed with the austerity of Father Nerinx's life on the frontier. The following excerpt is from an earlier period in his life, when he was still in Europe, but exiled from his home, and at a time when he maintained the hope that one day he would return. It gives us some insight into his hopes, dreams, and the work ethic that Margaret so admired. And I've been thinking perhaps they're sitting up there together listening to us tonight. When Father Nerinx was in hiding, he longed to return to his parish and wrote of what he would do when and if that ever happened. <clears throat> when it pleases God to send sunshine after this storm, I shall give him thanks. I shall go to Mechlin and pay my respects to my alma mater, to which I owe so much and I shall show my gratitude for God's mercies to me through it, which are without bounds. I must see about church arrangements and confirmations. My catechism must be printed. Then I must go to my flock. The church must be scrubbed and cleaned, and a procession must be organized to bring the relics of the saints and the Holy Cross from the house 
and during it we shall sing the psalms. My first calls must be made upon the sick, and I must visit my neighbor priests, especially those who visited my flock in my absence, and thank them. Let us respond with Father Nerings's words to us. The society exists for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Only trust in your vocation, expecting all from God's goodness. I know not what to say to impress you sufficiently with the sacredness of your calling. You must now be reunited and pull the same way. You must consult with one another and carry on everything the best you can. In prayer, don't worry your minds too much, but set your heart, your will, and your love to work. I hope Providence watches over you in temporal matters so that you have the prime necessities and with these we can be satisfied. Like Father Nerix, Margaret was a person of strong faith, expressed in service and loving concern for others. The following reading from Revelation fits her well. These are the words of the one who holds the seven stars in his hand. I know your work, your labor, and your patient endurance. Let anyone who has ears listen to what the Spirit says. To the one who perseveres in faith to the end, even in the face of suffering and death, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which stands in the paradise of God. I know how much you suffered for the Lord, and I know all about your poverty, but now you have heavenly riches. I shall also give you a white stone upon which is inscribed a new name, which no one knows except the one who receives it. And I will give you the morning star. Whoever has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says. We will close with Hail to the Queen. Oh, <laughs>
We will set up the microphones and begin our sharing here at the Mother House and then move to other places. When I was in St. Louis as coordinator, that's when I really began to know Margaret. I had known her at the Webster, I guess the last, maybe the last year she was at Webster. I knew her as Gerald Ann then. But Margaret became very ill and close to death. In fact, one night we didn't think she'd make it through the night. And when I was visiting her at the hospital, she said to me, who was the president? I can't remember, and so I told her who it was, and she's, this was in the mid-90s, late 90s, <clears throat> and so she said, I'd like you to write her a letter for me. I would like you to tell her that I thank her for all allowing me to be a member of the congregation. The community has always been good to me. I am grateful for all the years you have cared for me. Well, she didn't die <laughs> that time. <laughs> and I kept those words for years and, and have always cherished the thought that here, when she was dying and very, very sick, what she was thinking about was the community and her gratefulness. She was always caring. She was kindness and thoughtfulness, personified, and she had an unselfish generosity. She had nothing hardly in her room at the end because she gave it all away. Um, there are many stories that other people I'm sure will tell about Margaret that are funny, but I wanted the community to know how deeply, as was reflected in the reading of her life, that Margaret cared for her being a sister of Loretto and having her, her community members around her. Sister Lois Denfi, Margaret, um, moved from one table over to where Carol and I sat. And um, she didn't talk too much, but this one day she said, um, I said, well, or I asked her if she had anything that she knew, remembered from her childhood or something. Well, she said, one day when I was about nine or 10, I was out in the backyard where she lived, and I was so bored, I didn't know what to do. So I looked around, and I saw a barrel. I went over to the barrel. I looked in. There wasn't anything in it, so I climbed in the barrel. And there was a little hill, and she started rolling down the hill. Well... That was well and good, but below that little hill was a river. So um, what she said was, the barrel hit a rock, and that stopped it. I don't remember if she said it broke the barrel, but she said, I was saved from being in that river. <laughs> so that was one story she told. Another one, she didn't name her brothers, but um, 
maybe one of them was Gerald, I don't know. The two of them slept together in one of those beds that you put up into the wall. And um, that was her little job to get them up and then put the bed up. But this one morning, she didn't even notice that they were still in the bed. <laughs> and she put the bed up. Well, there wasn't a peep out of them, so she went on to breakfast. And while breakfast was going on, her mother said, well, where are the boys? Oh, and she thought, oh my goodness. So she went in quickly to their bedroom and pulled the bed down, and here were the two little boys in the bed. So she didn't say any more than that, but that they were okay and came to breakfast. It is with much gratitude that I want to say that Sister Margaret spoke so highly of the community of which she was a beautiful member, obviously. Um, I was felt very attracted to her as I went around meeting people that I did not know who had moved here since I was here the last time. And I found her so welcoming and so genuine and so real. And um, I thought, oh, I'd really like to get to know her better. And I said to her uh, shortly after that conversation, well, Sister Margaret, I'm going to eat dinner over here someplace. I don't know where I pointed to. I said, would you, would you be able to come over and sit with me? And she says, Oh, she said, this is my table. This is, these are the sisters that I dine with, and, and I wouldn't want to hurt them. And I thought, she's really of uh, genuine nature of love, I think. And, and I just was quite impressed with her. And she was just always very warm and cold and very <laughs> warm. I mean, because I was thinking of the cold that I have experienced before, but uh, not here. And maybe this is my opportunity to just I'm wanting to honor Sister Margaret and honor you, the living members who live as she described you and have welcomed me. And, and I appreciate each of you. And so, St. Margaret, keep praying for us. And thank you. A couple of years ago, I had the privilege of addressing Christmas cards for Margaret when she no longer could really see. Uh, but I want to tell you, she was the most alert person you could imagine. We would go through the address book and I would tell her what it said and she would say, oh, that's not right anymore. And then we'd have to go and look it up another place. Or we would get to them and I'd say so-and-so and she said, I'll just sign that one. Then we'd come to the next one and she'd say, give that to me, I'll write a little note, which was about three words probably, but it was, in, it was always in her own hand, the signature, only the envelopes did we do. I often sat at the, at the table with Sister Margaret in the Dumfries, and I'd always ask her, how are you doing? And she says, well, I'm still kicking. Shortly after I arrived here at the mother house, um, I noticed that Margaret um, 
would often go to the dining room mid-morning or mid-afternoon to have a, a little drink, maybe a hot chocolate or coffee. And so um, I thought, well, I, you know, she looks like a pretty saintly person. Maybe uh, some of it will rub off on me. So I began um, meeting with her at the mid-afternoon little repast. It was just really a drink and maybe sometimes a cookie. But she related some of those stories about her music how she suddenly one day realized that she could read music and began playing it and absolutely loved the piano. And um, I don't know how old she was, but she said one Lent, she decided to give up playing the piano. And she said that was the very hardest thing she ever did in her whole life. And she knew she couldn't do it the next year. Uh, she just loved playing the piano. And um, uh, one of the other things that... Um, um, in my packing and unpacking, I came across a little brain teaser that Margaret had put together with um, Loretto uh, community members' last names. And um, um, it was just different things like um, the family name, um, a famous ketchup, and that would be Heinz. And there were many others, but um, she and I tried to work on them one afternoon, and uh, she couldn't remember a lot of them. but. Uh, she had concocted it as she had signed it, concocted by Margaret Fitzgerald. And um, I always used to like to ask her how she was doing and that, well, I'm still kicking, so I'm sure she is. I took sister to the doctor uh, the week before she died. And she was um, very cheerful and very polite to the doctor. And he was amazed, you know, that she was a hundred. And I can't remember what he said to her, but they, they got along fine. And she was so gracious about what he uh, said to her and thanked him for treating her. Um, that's about the only thing I remember uh, her, as Anthony said, she, her room was, that always impressed me when she first came here, that her room was just the bare necessity. She didn't have anything extra. And the fact that every morning she was at church for prayers uh, impressed me too. Liz Perez here. Um, Pat reminded me in talking about uh, Margaret's simplicity and living very sparsely, but it sort of stretched into, you know, one of the things that I do aside from pastoral care is also to see to the sisters' undergarments. And uh, <laughs> I call myself the queen of underwear. But anyway, uh, one day, sometimes the people that fold come and leave these lovely little holy things by my door, the office door. And so one day appeared these very holy pair of underwear that were marked Sister Margaret Fitzgerald. And so it's like, oh dear. So I had to go across the hall and one day go and have this little delicate conversation with Margaret. And, uh, but she was always very kind. I'd say, Margaret, it's Liz Perez. And she goes, oh yes, yeah, sit down. And I said, well, I have something I need to talk to you about. Oh, okay, it sounds serious, she says. I said, well, I said, there's a matter of underwear. Whose, she says. 
I said, well, not mine. I think it's yours. Uh, I said, there's a matter of some holy underwear. And I said, and it's not just a few little holes, but quite a lot of holes. And, you know, Margaret always had this huge collection of of uh, safety pins. Well, I found out what she was using them for was to hold up that holy pair of underwear. And it wasn't just one, it was various. But anyway, so she was very good about, you know, saying, well, you know, I've been meaning to get to that. I, I figured, I said, well, why didn't you say something, Margaret? I would have gotten you something a long time ago. Well, I just thought sooner or later somebody would come along. I mean, just very matter of fact, very laid back. And I'd say, well, that time has come and here I am. <laughs> so we, we took care of her. And then there was the time when I was helping her pack for I believe the last time she went to St. Louis with Anthony Mary. And I went in and I said, oh, Margaret, are you getting excited about your trip to St. Louis? And she says, oh yes, I can hardly wait to go see all my old friends. Well, so I said, well, can I help you pack? She says, yes, and she knew exactly where everything was. Even though she couldn't really see very well, she knew what side of each drawer she had what. Yes, pull out one slip, three pair of underwear, you know, whatever, etc. one pair of stockings. I said, but Margaret, I thought you were gonna be gone a whole week. Yes, but I'll be washing. I'll wash my underwear every night. I say, okay. I mean, she had the smallest suitcase that I've ever seen, and in it, she said, oh, that'll be enough. Well, by the time I put the things in it that she said she wanted, there was hardly any anything in it. I mean, it didn't take up much room. So when she came back and I said to her, I said, well, Margaret, how was your wonderful trip? Did you have a great time? Well... I, uh, did you go here? Did you do this? Did you do that? Well, no, not really. I really didn't find anybody that I knew too much down there. I, I became aware that they're all here with me, and I didn't realize it. I said, well, that's how it happens, but I guess you had a nice trip with Anthony. Oh, yes, I always have a nice time with Anthony. And the very last thing I'll say is that a day or two, probably a couple of days before Margaret died, she was propped up on the bed. And they were trying to get fluids, at least some liquids in her. And no, she didn't want anything to eat. She didn't want any, any, uh, anything to drink. And she didn't like ice cream. So milkshakes was out of the question. And so I said, oh, Margaret, I said, how about just a little of this or a little of that? I, no, I don't think so. I said, well, I wish I could find just something that you would like, and I would bring it to you if you just tell me. Well, you're here, and I like you. <laughs> Wasn't that sweet? <laughs> Thank you. The food, the food issue seemed to be uh, in, coming up every once in a while. Again, when I was in St. Louis, we also were trying to get her to eat. And one day in the hospital, I said to her, Margaret, will you, I'll, we had to feed her three times a day. Would somebody go over to the hospital f with her because she couldn't eat at that time, didn't have the strength. So I said, what would you like? I'd like some milk toast. And I said, uh, well, I know Leo Ann used to make milk toast, but can you tell me how to make it? Yes, she said, you take toast, you make toast, and you cut it up in little pieces, and you get hot milk and butter, and then you put it together and you put a little sugar in it. Well, I tried my best, but it didn't meet her mother's ex uh, recipe, I think. In fact, I bought a, a toaster to bring into the hospital so I could toast the, the bread for her. 
And when she went to the nursing home, she again wanted milk toast. So I went down to the kitchen. I said to the lady there, can you make me a little cup of milk toast? Honey, she said, I ain't never made milk toast, but I'll try anything. So she did have some things that she liked. And about a week before she got sick this last time, uh, I asked her if she wanted to go out for lunch. Again, she had not been eating too well. So we were going somewhere that had frog legs. It was a Friday. I said, would you like, have you ever eaten frog legs? And she said, I don't think so. So we got to the place, the restaurant, uh, and I said, well, I'll give you, I'll give you some of mine. So I gave her one and just one of the frog legs. And she just kind of snarfed it down. And I said, would you like another? Yes, yeah, she said, I think I would. And so I said, well, you've had another experience in your life. You've eaten, you, you've eaten your first frog legs. And so... But she wrote me a thank you note after that. I mean, she was always grateful for anything anybody did and said, it was a wonderful day out, and I really appreciated it. And thank you very much. Since that was her life, thank you all for everything. I forgot this earlier. Um, Margaret didn't like blue, the color blue, and um, someone um, was fixing up some, some clothes for her, and they gave her several dresses, and don't you know, all of them were blue, and she didn't like any of them, but she would wear them, but uh, for uh, her jubilee, I believe Anthony got her a dress that was not blue. Margaret was a member of Community Group 18, as are a number of people here tonight. And I don't know this for sure, but I can't recall any meeting that she missed. And we're a pretty large group, and we can get carrying on. And Margaret, um, of course, couldn't hear much of what was being said, and she couldn't see very much. And I don't remember how it happened, but um, one time she's, somebody must have said um, something about her coming, and, and she just said simply, I just like being with you all. And I remember feeling the way one might feel if like the queen had said, I just like being with you. Um, she was just such um, a presence. And, and what that has taught me is, um, you know, how we tend to minimize the presence that we are or bring to a situation. And yet her presence was, um, was really powerful, at least to me, palpable. And I'm grateful that she um, was humble enough to continue coming and being present and giving us that, that gift. I think we're finished at the mother house, Rebecca. Okay. So, um, my suggestion is for those in the rest of the country, if you have a story to share about Margaret. They're putting in a plug, we'll be with you in a minute. Okay. Uh, for the rest of you, if you have um, a story to share about Margaret, if you would actually raise your physical hand, because I can see you, <laughs> um, and I will unmute you and let you tell your story. All right, so I'm going to pass it over to Barbara Nicholas. Barbara, you've got the floor. Oh, thank you, uh, Rebecca. 
You know, um, a, a million years ago, I remember when I'm, uh, after some time uh, had passed, between the times that I had seen Margaret and was visiting her again, she said, you know, I want to tell you, I pray for you. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm so appreciative of that. And she said, by name. And, um, you know, I, that struck me just very warmly and very tenderly. And it's, um, it's something that I try to remember to say to that uh, the difference that it made to me to hear it from her by name is just something really very precious and very important. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, and we'll go over to Barbara Ann Barbado. All right. I have two, two things to say about Margaret. One is that I used to uh, often sit at the table where she was when she was at, at the center here in St. Louis um, for a long, long time. Uh, we, she always had a story, uh, a funny story. She, was, she would collect jokes so that she could always have a, story, a funny story to tell at, at, the, at the meal. And uh, uh, so we always we always have that, and that's one thing I know about Margaret for many years at, at uh, five ninety. But the other thing is that shortly after she came to um, the center, Sister Lucy Ruth, with whom I lived, had a little note from her, and she said, uh, and and the note told Lucy that the sisters at the center were each praying for a different one of the sisters who did not live at the center, and that Sister Lucy Ruth was the one she was praying for. And uh, so, uh, so Margaret became very special to our household uh, in, an, in, in a relationship that was, uh, I'd say, more intimate than, than before. And, uh, uh, after Lucy Ruth died, and even when she was very sick, Margaret said that she prayed for me by name as well. And so all through the years, uh, Margaret and I used to talk about praying for one another uh, uh, by name. So, thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, anybody else? I don't see any hands in Denver. Okay, so Mother House, I think we're going back to you. And we will close with My Soul Give Thanks. My soul give thanks to the Lord. Thank you all.